Hey everyone. So over the past couple of weeks, I've been intending to make more sort of YouTube specific content. And I have a lot of ideas for instructive material and um, I've sort of procrastinated, but this is gonna be the first video where I sort of start consistently making more content specifically for YouTube. And um, the first thing I wanted to do is make more videos on topics that kind of got a lot of positive feedback. One of them, uh, was a series of requests that I would get on my stream uh, to do more videos where I basically go through problems, puzzles of different levels and explain my thought process in a lot of depth and sort of give um, specific pointers on how to solve exercises and how to use them properly for tactical improvement. And that is what we are going to be doing in this video. So uh, we are going to be solving a uh, exercises, probably about 10 exercises, in the approximate intermediate range. And using chess.com's puzzle tool, I'm gonna to set the rating range of the problems to be from 1500 to 2200. So it's gonna be a pretty broad range. I did a, a previous series where I did Puzzle Rush Survival. This is gonna be a little bit different. So we're gonna get exercises of various difficulties. And uh, I'm gonna to try to explain in as much depth uh, and breadth as possible, the exact uh, process that I use to solve these exercises. And hopefully you'll find it helpful. Let's jump in. Okay, so first problem uh, is a really easy one. Now, the very first thing I see is that black's got a weak back rank. What I mean by that is that the king has no escape on the seventh rank. By the way, compared to white's uh, back rank, white has uh, a square on h2, so there's no back rank problems. And black has no pieces on that back rank, so I'm immediately looking for various checks that I can deliver on that back rank. Now, queen c8 check would be great, except there's a bishop there controlling c8. Queen d8 check also seems impossible, but I also notice that there's a rook on d1. So this is a classic example of an x-ray where even though there is an opposing piece between two of your pieces, if it's a long range piece such as a rook, it's going to be kind of ghost controlling the other piece. So when we play queen d8, the, the black rook has to take the queen and then the white rook is going to swoop in and capture d8 with checkmate. So queen d8, and now rook takes d8 is made. Okay, that was a pretty simple exercise. Let's move on. All right, so black has just played e5. It seems to be a complicated opening position. Now I notice a couple of things. Material seems to be equal. I notice that we are in a pin. So it's, it's probably not going to be knight takes e5. But I do notice something interesting about the placement of black's queen, which is that if this knight ever does land on e5, it's going to be counterattacking black's queen. So it might not be such a big problem that we're pinned. Now, the immediate knight takes e5 is bad, but not because black takes the queen. If black takes the queen, then we take black's queen. And then if black takes on d7, then we can recapture that bishop and we're up a pawn. The issue, though, with taking on e5 is that black can simply recapture that knight. And our queen is going to be under attack, so we're going to end up a piece down. But what if we take on e5 with a pawn? Let's try to flesh that out. Okay, so probably black is going to recapture with, let's say, the knight, okay? Again, if we take that knight with our knight, then black takes it with his bishop, and again, our queen is hanging, that's not a problem. But, so we take with a pawn, black takes with a knight. What if we take that knight with our bishop? Then, after black takes that bishop with his bishop, black has no longer any pieces controlling e5. We can take that with our knight, and then we have that situation I mentioned originally where both queens are hanging, except we've already won a piece. And we seem to preserve that extra piece after bishop takes d1, knight takes d7. So I think it's just d takes e5. And now very important, we don't take with the knight because then knight takes e5 and black is fine. We take with the bishop. Okay, so they take on f3. But I think the critical line would have been knight takes e5 and then knight takes e5. Bishop takes f3. Now we take with the knight and we preserve our defense of the bishop. We're up a piece. So I would say the important thing in this exercise is to realize that unless your king is pinned, in which case it is literally illegal to move the pin piece, a lot of people seem to think of it the same way when their queen is pinned, but you're, you can move a piece that's pinned to the queen, and often you can move it if you're attacking the opposing queen. So if your knight is the one that's pinned, you always want to identify situations where your opponent's queen is attackable by that knight, because that could be a way to escape the pin. In this case, knight takes e5 at the right moment was exactly a way to do that. So that placement of black's queen is super pivotal here. Okay, we've got a pretty messy position here. 
Okay, white's going this way. So the first thing I, just to get my bearings here, let, let's figure out what happens if white makes a queen. Well, if white makes a queen, then there's gonna be a, an unfortunate alignment of king and queen. Black has bishop e6 check and black wins the queen back. That doesn't seem to be correct. So what I'm immediately thinking about is a way of trying to get black's king onto a square such that we could promote with check. Okay, so in order for that to happen, we need to start looking at checks. The only check that I see, right, knight f5 is ridiculous because bishop can just take, uh, is, is knight g8 check. Okay, so what happens after knight g8 check? If the king drops back to h7, then we have checkmate on g5. That's also a fork. Unfortunately, I think the king walks up to h5. And if that knight goes to f6, then the king hides on h4. And neither of the two knights has any way of checking the king. And again, if we promote in that position, then black still has bishop e6 because we haven't dislodged black's queen. Now, are there any other checks in this position? Well, there is one other check, and that is to under-promote to a knight and make a third knight, g8 equals knight. So let's calculate that. And notice how I'm not really trying, I'm not ruling that option out because it looks absurd. I know that three knights can collaborate to give checkmate, and you should understand that too because black's king is so close to the side of the board. So g8 equals knight. The king has two escape squares. If the king moves back to h7, I think it's the mate is pretty easy. We move this knight into f6. And then after the king comes into the corner, the other knight swings around to g6, and that's mate. So after g8 knight, the king has to go up to h5. But then, just using process of elimination, that newly promoted knight can go back to f6 with a check. And if the king moves up to h4, then knight g6 is mate. Notice how this knight guards g3. And if the king moves back down to h6, then this knight goes to g8 with mate. Now I know that's, you know, that's a little bit confusing, but what I would do is pause the video and, and try to make sure that you can understand in your head all of the mating lines after g8 equals knight. Okay, so they move up to h5. By the way, the reason we go, don't go with this knight is because then we relinquish control of this g3 square. I'm gonna highlight it in orange. The king goes up to h4 and then it escapes via g3. So we need this knight to go back. And now we need this knight to go out to g6. This is simply checkmate. Now, what is the lesson we learned here? Well, first of all, when you have these confusing positions, a good way to get your bearings is just to consider an obvious move. See if you can identify what the, what the problem is. And then once you do that, that often leads you to the next logical step. Like, oh, we understand why we can't promote to a queen. So we've kind of determined that we have to play with checks. And my original goal was to find a way to get black's king onto a square where we could promote with check. And the solution wasn't actually that, it was actually just checkmate, but that's how chess thinking works. You start with one goal and then that leads you to the solution even if the solution uh, has a different logical aim in mind. Okay, so next position. Well, this one also seems pretty easy. Currently black is up a piece. The first thing I notice is I always start by looking at pins. So there's a lot of pins here and the more pins there are, the more tactical potential there is. And when you have two pins combining like this, that leads to the possibility of rook takes e6 check. All right, so rook takes e6 check. Black can't take back. Black has to move the king away. And actually that situation is not so simple, but I'm not saying you can kind of cheat, but here we can use process of elimination. My intuition is kind of saying that rook takes e6 is the correct first move, just because taking a piece like this with check, well, that's gotta be correct. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna risk it. Now, this position is a little bit more confusing because if we simply take black's bishop, then black can now take the rook. And this is one thing I want to point out. Pins are very impermanent. So if you identify a couple of pins in a position, you always have to update your board state. And you always have to make sure that your opponent move, opponent's move didn't unpin one of the pins that you had. This is a very, very common way of blundering. So now black is attacking the rook. What can we do about that? Well. I see a couple of possibilities. We can take on c6. We can basically say if we're losing the rook anyway, we can take the knight. Black takes back, and then we take on c3. Well, then we've got two pieces for a rook, but that's not particularly convincing. The queen could move out to f6. Our king is also really weak there. I'm not convinced by that. What else do we have? Well, the other thing that we can do is we can create an EST, equal or stronger threat. And using this other pin, I'm thinking about the simple rook takes d5. That hits black's queen, it gets the rook into the game. And without doing any further calculation, it just looks devastating. Look at how many pieces we're gonna have in the attack. 
our bishop is also going to be aiming at f7 together with the queen. But that's a potential mating idea. I think we can just go for it. Rook takes d5. Okay, f takes d6 is easy. So we take the queen and then we take the bishop and we have a big material advantage. Pretty easy, but uh, this is all about just brute forcing your way into it. Don't get overwhelmed by the number of hanging pieces. Just treat this like any other position. And remember the concept of EST, like you, it, it, when you have a lot of attacking potential, oftentimes you don't have to respond to threats directly. You can just pose stronger threats. Okay, 94. So this is interesting. I don't see anything straight off the bat. Now, what I do see, we have a pin here, which prevents the F pawn from moving. Why is that important? The other, the immediate logical step that I make is that if we can manage to build a battery on the long diagonal with the queen in front, then let's say we manage to get our queen to c3, then we threaten checkmate on g7. And because of this other pin, black will be unable to go f6. So a situation might arise where black is simply unable to prevent checkmate without material losses. Is there a way of getting the queen to c3? Well, the move f3 comes to mind. But when you make, I mean, as Ben Feingold would tell us, when you play f3 in any position, you have to consider the way that you weaken your king side. And the move f3 weakens this diagonal, right? It exposes it. And if you look hard enough, you'll see that queen c5 check in response to f3 basically forces the queen trade. And then after queen takes c5, knight takes c5, black seems to be all right. They're probably worse, but all right. Now, are there any other ways of getting the knight off the board? Well, we can literally take it. Let's consider the sacrifice. Rook takes c4. Black will probably take back with a rook. And then we go queen c3. Okay, so... We already know that black can't play f6. Does black have any other ways of defending g7? Well, black could put a piece on e5, but we have two attackers and black has only one defender, so we'll be a piece up. But wait a second. After rook takes e4, rook takes e4, queen c3, black can swing this rook to g4 and defend that square. And this is where I think a lot of players would reject rook takes e4, except you have to do one very important thing. When you calculate a line like this, you cannot fixate only on one aspect of the position. You have to take the bigger picture view and see if there's any other, because what can happen is you might have a sequence of moves, as I said previously, that you play for one reason, right? Why did we take on e4? We took on e4 in order to threaten checkmate on g7. But in the course of making these moves, it might turn out that there's all of a sudden some new x-ray or new pin that maybe you didn't notice, but that you have to notice now in order to find the correct, the correct approach. And that's what happens here. So rook takes e4, rook takes e4, queen c3, rook g4. And if I look at the whole board, I will see that the queens are facing each other. Now, what can we do about that? Well, black's queen is unprotected, which means there might be a discovery with the bishop. There is a discovery with the bishop. It is to take on f7 and expose black's queen. So we actually don't give checkmate. We win black's queen. Now, one of the small flaws of puzzle rush is that they don't always have the best continuations or the most instructive continuations. But uh, hopefully you guys were able to follow that line. The way that they do it, it's just pretty simple. We win a piece. But again, if rook takes e4 had happened, then after queen c3, rook g4, we would have had to see that the queens are facing each other. The lesson here is to always look at the whole board, especially at the end of a variation. Um, try to see if there are any new x-rays, any new pins that you can use to do something other than what you set out to do initially. Okay, next position. Well, this one is a, is a pretty elementary mate in two moves. Um, first thing I see, other than the fact that we're down a queen, is this uh, x-ray against the king. So that's a potential discovery. And we have the move knight g5 check, which wins back black's queen. But you have to see the bigger picture here, which is that let's, let's say we play knight g5 check. Are, is white winning there? Well, not really, because what happens? Black's king moves away. We take black's queen... And black recaptures our knight. And if you look carefully, you'll see that, in fact, white is simply down a pawn at the end of that line. Okay, so that's why you always have to count material. And I even tell this to my high-rated students, you have to count the material at the start of the exercise because otherwise you're going to find a way to win material and you're just going to go for it because you think, oh, we win black's queen. But you're down a queen to begin with, so it's not actually that impressive. Let's look for something more ambitious. Where else could the knight move to? Well, when you've got an extra eight, you should look for double checks because double checks essentially force the opponent's king to move aside. That's, that's the rule because the check is coming from two different places. There's two double checks. There's knight d6 and there's knight f6. Let's compare and contrast. Well, knight d6 allows the king to move to d7. 
And that seems to be a dead end. What about knight f6 check? Well, then king d7 is impossible. The king has to move aside to d8. And then this rook could swoop in with checkmate. So this is a pretty simple exercise, but I just wanted to deconstruct it for you. Remember this mating pattern. That knight, I think it's called an Arabian mate. The knight supporting the rook. And of course, the king unable to move to c7 because there's a pawn there. But this is all about not limiting yourself to a tempting move, but instead looking for a better one, especially when it comes to your opponent's king. Okay, let's go on. And maybe after this exercise, um, I can I can up the, the, the problem range just a little bit um, and solve a couple of, of puzzles in the 2200 range before, uh, before finishing the video. Okay, so this is another one of those where there's a lot going on. Okay, so looking at this position, material... Okay, black is up a pawn. That's not that important. The queen is hanging in several different ways. So again, as I've advised, one way to get your bearings is just to consider a move. Like, what's the simplest move for black in this position? Well, it's probably to take white's queen, right? What happens if we take white's queen? Well, if we take white's queen, probably white is going to take back with a rook, right? And what else do I notice in that position? Well, I notice that black's rook is hanging. And if we move the rook back, white can take on f7 with either piece. And it's just a mess there, right? We're not even up anything. And it appears to me that Black's King is a lot less safe than White's King, even in the even in the end game. So that tells me that there's something better than just moving the Queen. What could it be? Well, let's focus instead on some of the assets we have. We have a bishop that's on the long diagonal, always a good thing. And the H file is also open. And whenever there's an open file near your opponent's king, that should always be considered. I mean, that can be a gateway to some sort of a tactic. And maybe many of you are seeing this on the spot because you know this pattern, but uh, the idea here is to get this king onto the, the h1 square, onto this diagonal. And um, I don't have a name for this type of tactic. It's almost like replacing one piece with another. What we want to do here is go rook h1 check. We get the king onto that square. The pawn is now pinned. So in effect, the h3 square is no longer defended. And I literally like to think of it that way. If a pawn is pinned, then the squares that it would otherwise be defending are undefended. Imagine that there was a zebra on g2. And why do I say there was a zebra rather than nothing? If there was nothing on g2, it would be hard to visualize the position because the king would literally be in check. So let's say there's a giraffe or a zebra on g2. What do you do? Well, obviously you play queen h3 and queen takes queen and the giraffe doesn't move diagonally and it cannot move through a pin. <laughs> but because there's a pawn there, I think a lot of people have this natural resistance to putting the queen on a square where it can be captured, even though, of course, in this case, it cannot be. Remember that pins are... They are omnipotent. You can't violate the rules of chess. So whenever there is any kind of pin, look at the squares that would otherwise be defended by the pinned piece. You can often put one of your pieces there to create effect. That is exactly what happens here. Queen h3 and queen takes g2 is checkmate. Okay. Um, actually, I've changed my mind. I think I'm going I'm going to make a second video that's going to come out uh, after this one where I'm going to sort of up the rating and, and do some puzzles in the 22, 2500 range. I think this is a pretty good difficulty for now. Uh, but if you're if you're higher rated and uh, you're getting bored, I will definitely make videos. Uh, the next video actually will be significantly tougher in terms of difficulty. All right, I'm thinking we can do probably three more and, and then round it off. So this one I actually recognize. I've given it to some students. This is a great exercise in sort of understanding the way that chess geometry works. Now, clearly, we have a situation where Black's king is really weak. Counting up the material, we see that black is a piece out. Black is up a knight here. Black has two knights, and white only has one. And so the very first thing that I see when I look at this position is a fork. We see that the knight on e4 is undefended. Maybe you also see this. And you see queen g4 check or queen f5 check, uh, and that picks off the knight. But, you know, and this is maybe a little bit of cheating, but if you're actually solving exercises, and if you've solved exercises regularly, you know that the bounds of success are greater than just being a pawn up. And what I want you to understand here is that even if you win this knight back, white is the material is going to be essentially equal. White is going to be only a pawn up. For example, let's say we play queen g4 check. The king drops back to e8, which is not the best move, but whatever. Then we take the knight. What, well, what does black do there? Black probably blocks that check with a queen and forces an endgame. And in that endgame, white is only a pawn up, which is not the worst case, but it's also not the best case. We have to look for more. Now, we have to look for more might mean forget the concept of winning the knight. 
but it could also mean that one of the moves you originally made in order to win the knight might turn out to be good for a different reason. This is what I mentioned earlier. I think a lot of people get tempted by the move queen f7 check. That move just looks good. But delve into it for a second and you'll see that after queen blocks on e7, white has absolutely no follow-up. You could give a fancy check on e6 with the bishop because the queen can't take. But um, one other quick little detour. Remember that when a piece blocks a check, the square formerly occupied by that piece is now accessible to the king. I see this mistake all the time um, in students of different ranges. What will happen is when there's a longer line that they're visualizing, they will forget that a certain piece left a square and now the king can move there. So after queen f7, queen e7, bishop e6, they will think that king c6 is the only move. It's not such a bad move, but king d8 is possible and white is at a dead end. So it appears that we have to re... And checks like bishop e5 don't do anything. They're easily blocked by the pawn. So maybe we can revisit the two initial moves we started with and see if any of them actually produce a better result than we thought it would. Let's start with queen f5 check. Now, if the king moves back to e8 or e7, then wait a second. I, I think we can just checkmate on f7. That's a kind of a scholar's mate pattern. What about queen f5, king c6? Now, if you forget that you can take the knight, just look at the king position. White has checkmate in one. This bishop on c4 guards the b5 square. After queen f5, king c6, we go queen b5, and that's simply checkmate. By the way, we, did, we wouldn't have the same thing after queen g4, because there the king could go back to e8 or even up to c6, and we would have no, no checkmate. I spent a while on this problem because I think it, it teaches you two things. The first is not to get fixated when you just see a way to win a piece but to get into the habit of looking more ambitiously and then spending some time. And if you don't find anything, then you can always come back and, and, and win the piece. The second is to just appreciate the fact that, you know, two pieces can, can combine uh, with tremendous power in chess. You, you often only need two pieces to form a wide variety of mating patterns. And uh, there's nothing you need to do about that, but just appreciate some of these mating patterns and try to commit them to memory. You know, the scholar's mate pattern, the pattern where there's a king on the sixth rank and then there's a bishop and a queen creating a battery like this. Just something to just something to notice. Okay, so this is an end game. It appears that we are playing black and we are moving this way. Okay, so to me, it's quite clear that we need to try to make a draw. We are not going to promote this pawn. The rook can always stop the pawn and give itself away for it. The, the question is, why not push the pawn up to g2, up to b2? Well, probably white's going to stop it right with rook b6. And the only thing we have there is to move the king up to uh, c3. Now, what's going on in that position? Well, in that position, we want to move the king further up to c2 in order to help the pawn promote, right? Does white, is white capable of doing anything to stop that? Well, the only thing that I see is white could try to give us a check and somehow move the king to an undesirable position. So white gives the check, the king moves aside to b3, and something I said in the last exercise applies here. Don't forget that when a piece moves from a square, it's no longer doing the things that it was doing there. So after the rook gives a check on c6, white has taken his eyes off of that passed pawn, which can now potentially promote. So after b2, rook b6, king c3, rook c6 check, king b3, white has to stop the pawn again. And so white doesn't have anything that he can do other than going back to b6. And that's a repetition of moves. We are totally fine with that because we're trying to make a draw here. So... I think the move is just b2, king c3. Okay, king e2 doesn't accomplish anything. It just helps us accomplish our goal up to c2. Now, we don't want to go to b1 and block our own pawn. We go back to b3, and we have succeeded in holding a draw. Okay, let's solve one final position. Now, this is one on just recognizing mating patterns. Um, I've advised this in a previous puzzle solving video. You should always identify situations where your opponent's king has no squares. Anytime your opponent's king has no squares, what do I mean by that? I mean, if it was a check, it would be made. Like there are physically no squares it can move to. That is a very powerful precursor to a lot of different types of combinations because even though you might not see immediately a way to expose the king and give checkmate, something might come up a little bit down the line. Now, in this case, it's just such a situation. White's king, by the way, is not in that same boat. It's got d2. Now, if you could magically transport this knight to g6, it would be checkmate because the pawn is pinned. 
We also have a couple of heavy pieces. We have the queen, we have the rook. If there was no pawn on h7, it would also be checkmate. So that's another type of observation that you could make. If a certain file was open, we would be able to give checkmate on that file. That's the case here. As it stands, we have two heavy pieces. What we could do, the idea that stems from that, is we could sacrifice the queen on h7 with only one purpose. The purpose of that move is not to get the king somewhere. It's to remove that pawn from the board. And after king takes h7, we go rook h1, and that's mate. After bishop h4, rook, rook takes h4. Uh, notice the role of the f5 pawn. That's very important. Without that pawn, this would not work because the king would be able to escape to g6, right? So we have to appreciate the role of every pawn here. This bishop is unnecessary. Even this knight is unnecessary. They don't play a role in the combination. Boom, 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 checkmate. One other thing I'd like to point out. When you're calculating such a line, make sure that you account for any pieces that could block the check. I often feel that when there is a lateral, that when, when there's a vertical check rather that's delivered by rook, people tend to forget that vertical checks can be blocked. So for instance, let's imagine that black's queen had been on d4 here. Well, what would happen then? Then the move bishop h4 would actually be super effective. It would win the game for black because uh, the queen would be guarding the bishop. So remember to check for that. Here, bishop h4 doesn't help because that square is undefended. We just take on h4. That was a pretty simple problem, kind of an Anastasia's mate. But nonetheless, I think that was a helpful, helpful takeaway. Okay, well, that was 10 problems. I think um, that's perfect for this video. Um, in the subsequent video, I will solve problems in, I would say, the rating range 2200 to 2700. And I'm going to make a couple of these videos. I might also go lower and do some problems for uh, folks who, who just started playing. Um, I think problem solving is is universally helpful at all levels. And hopefully I can cover a lot of rating ranges. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. And um, hopefully I wasn't didn't ramble too much. And I will see you again in the next puzzle solving video. Thanks again for watching. And uh, goodbye until the next video.